What up, guys? It's lovely. So, I'm gonna keep reading liberal fascism for you guys. And we are pretty much halfway there with what the original edition was. I believe it was maybe 380 pages. We're at like 163. So, I mean, we're, we're gonna make it. We're gonna make it. So, um, I'm now on the fifth chapter, which is about the 60s, and as you heard in uh, the ending of my last video, uh, reading liberal fascism, I basically said that's when the degeneracy in America started. Uh, yeah, I would have to say that probably is... I mean, you can look at it from two stances. It could have been the best thing for America, it could have been the worst thing, I mean... There was a lot of drug use, man. <laughs> uh, that's what I would say, degenerated society. The whole free love, free drug thing. I mean, people aren't modest anymore. And I think modesty is very important, but... I mean, back then, they just showed their bodies because they were liberated. So, I mean, that's obviously reflective today. People still want to show their bodies, and... I guess the world is divided on this kind of thing, you know? People are okay with showing your body, people are not. Um, I would say where I live, which was highly affected by the, by the 60s, since, I mean, it's California. Just go to San Francisco, you basically, you'll basically see all the hippies there too. Um, I live in the Los Angeles area, so is it hippie-ish? Kind of. Uh, we're very, <laughs> we're very about, uh, culture, I suppose, which is okay with me. I mean, it's changed my perspective on lots of things in life, but, eh. Anyhow, the 60s, the start of degeneracy. <laughs> so, we're gonna be reading about the 60s in Liberal Fascism by Jonah Goldberg. And, um... Yeah, I'll just stop reading when I find a suitable place to end. I didn't really think this through. I usually think it through before starting, but this time I didn't. Let's just read it and we'll stop when I feel like it. <laughs> so, the 1960s, fascism takes to the streets. The self-styled revolutionaries had grown increasingly brazen in their campaign to force concessions from the university. Students and professors who were labeled race traitors received death threats. Oh shit, that'd be me. <laughs> uh, enemies of the racial nation were savagely beaten by roaming thugs. Guns were brought onto the campus and the students dressed up in military uniforms. Professors were held hostage, badgered, intimidated, and threatened whenever their teaching contradicted racial orthodoxy. But the university administration, out of a mixture of cowardice and sympathy for the rebels, refused to punish the revolutionaries, even when the president was manhandled by a fascist goon in front of an audience made up of the campus community. Um, so, I'm just assuming that it's about uh, equal rights between races, but at the, same at the same time, they are saying race traitor, so it could be about whites, you know, someone teaching the opposite, as in all races are equal, instead of whites obviously being superior. Um, I mean, I'm not really sure. I would say it's the other way around, but yeah, I mean, even today you see it on college campuses, but, but back then, gosh, they were pretty horrible. They rioted all the time. <laughs> yeah, it is kind of reflective of what um, college campuses are like today, but they rioted, they fought against the police, <laughs> they did a lot of crazy shit back then, all in the name of equality. And, um, it's this whole infantilization of, of kids. I mean, you know, when you're in college, it's basically like you're still a kid, but you're an adult. You're being taken care of by the faculty and the professors. I mean, you know, when they demand that the, the, the colleges are a safe space, even though, you know, you're going to college so you can become a well-rounded person for the outside world, they want the college campuses to be a safe space. 
because they still act like it's their home because they're teenagers still in their mindset. They think that they're growing up by doing all this activist shit and that they're just, um, I suppose, shaping their environment, but they're not doing it for the right reasons and essentially they're just keeping themselves in a childlike state by, uh, by doing that. So. Obviously, the faculty and the professors, you know, everyone at the school who is not a student, who works for the students to, to help them and to teach them and, you know, all that kind of stuff, they want to, they want to make sure the kids are obviously heard, because yes, that is important, I do believe students should be heard, but obviously not to the extent that they're taking it. In, in this circumstance, um, they want to make sure that the students are heard because, you know, that's an institution. They want people to go to their institution. They don't want people to drop out. They want to be considerate because this is the livelihood of their campus and um, it reflects on them. And if people think, well, this school doesn't, this school doesn't hear out its students, who's going to want to sign up for that school? Who's going to want to actually go and attend a school where they're not heard out? Um, so, obviously the campuses are going to cater to them in that sense, but, um, I mean, that basically infantilizes them. You're not going to get everything you want in life. You can't just protest uh, and whine like a baby and expect uh, the result you want because you did that. Just because you whine and ask for something doesn't mean you're going to get it. And um, by, by doing so, by, by allowing them to do it and sympathizing with them, the faculty is basically keeping them as children. They are going to grow up expecting things out of life that they're not going to get, and that's essentially going to hurt them in the long run. The world is not, the world is not a liberal arts college campus. It's not going to protect you for the rest of your life. And you might think you're doing something big right now, rioting and protesting and doing all this stuff that you want to you want to be a so-called activist. You're not doing shit. You're just looking stupid. So I mean, if they if they want to if they want the rise in stupidity and revolution, <laughs> sure, go ahead, but uh, the college campuses back then, they, that, that, that's not helping anyone, and it's still going on today. So, I mean, it's, it's hurting more than helping, is what I'm getting across. The radicals and their student sympathizers believed themselves to be revolutionaries of the left, the opposite of fascists in their mind. Uh, yet, when one of their professors read them the speeches of Benito Mussolini, the students reacted with enthusiasm. Events came to a climax when students took over the student union and the local radio station. Armed with rifles and shotguns, they demanded an ethnically pure educational institution staffed and run by members of their own race. Okay, so this situation is not one of equal rights, but rather um, in ethnocentric teaching. Um, okay. <laughs> I mean, obviously times have changed for the left. We're going from center from centering on whites to centering on multiculturalism on the left that is pretty interesting but even so even so my what i just explained still stands they are whining about something that they shouldn't be whining about and and another thing college is so you can learn about different viewpoints right so, I mean, you can't go to college expecting to hear one side of the story. I only want to hear about white people, or I only want to hear about people of color. Nope, nope, you can't, you can't do that shit. You can't. You're going to hear things from every single angle, okay? And that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. And, yeah, this is, this is reflective of fascism. I, they're protesting to hear one viewpoint. <laughs> Because they want to be a fucking collective. They want to hear stuff that they agree with. And maybe you, you're not going to agree with everything that a white person says, but they just want to hear it from a white person. They'd rather hear it from a white person. And that's still fascistic in the sense that they want to only hear 
uh, one side of the story rather than other races sides, I suppose. I mean, ugh, this kind of stuff is just annoying. Um, at first, the faculty and administration were understandably reluctant, but when it was suggested that those who opposed their agenda might be killed, wow, wow, killed, not even hurt, but killed, <laughs> oh man, <laughs> killed, uh, most of the moderates quickly reversed course and supported the militants because they were afraid. They want to save themselves, so they're going to just go ahead and... And <laughs> they're gonna go with the people who are threatening to kill them. In a mass rally reminiscent of Nuremberg, the professors recanted their reactionary ways and swore fidelity to the new revolutionary order. Oh gosh. Okay, so, you know, I wanna go to Yale and stuff like that. <laughs> and stuff like that. I, I wanna go to Yale, alright? And uh, I think everyone knows the Yale screeching girl by now. Yeah, that black chick that just started yelling at, uh, what's his last name, Christakis, Professor Christakis, yeah, she started yelling at him, I was so displeased when I saw that, I was just like, wow, and she will probably not be held accountable, <laughs> she probably graduated, but she probably wasn't held accountable for yelling at her teacher to take his step down as a master of Silliman College, and it's not even master anymore, it's head because master's offensive. Um, right, I have a lot of criticism about Yale for some of the stuff that they do. Um, and a lot of people didn't even think that the change to Master was even necessary. So, I, I think they were just copying Harvard. But, uh, I don't think it was necessary for them to change it from Master of the College to Head of the College. It's literally the same thing. Be <laughs> it's just, it's so stupid to me. But... She yelled at her teacher to take this, his step down as master of the college, which he did. He resigned. Um, obviously, he did it probably not forced to, but it, I mean, it, they probably said it's in your best interest to do it. So he's no longer the head of the college at uh, uh, of Silliman College at Yale. And it's just like, dude, you should... No, that's not, I mean, to me, that's not what should have happened, because, as, as is said right here, they were, they reversed course and supported the militants. He basically is like, I, if you can't beat them, join them. Um, he couldn't beat them, obviously, I mean, they're gonna talk about their rights and their stupid, it's racist shit. Um, they're gonna talk about that, so he's just gonna look like the bad one in that situation, because we also have to hear their voices, they're the future. They're an idiotic future, that's what I tell you. Um, <laughs> um, but he couldn't beat them, so he just resigned from his position so that it wouldn't be worse for him. He still works there, obviously. But, I mean, in the long run, if he had kept his position, I think things would have turned out much worse for him. So he's basically like, you know what? Things aren't going to get any better for me if I keep this position, so I'm going to resign. That's probably what happened, and by doing so, I mean, again, it's the whole infantilization. They get what they want, they're never going to learn how to react to not getting what they want, which is exactly why all these college campuses have people protesting Trump. They think that their protests are going to somehow um, change, <laughs> change the presidency from Trump to Hillary. No, get over it. You're just looking stupid. You're doing this and it it's not going to amount to anything you just want to be an activist but you're nothing okay you're just a kid who's in a college who thinks that they're tr doing something for the world when they're not okay you're gonna look back at these days and you're gonna say wow I was stupid or not because <laughs> you might be stuck in that uh, frame of mind but still it's just it's so childlike. Um, one professor later recalled how easily pompous teachers who cathechized, man, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Whatever, cathechized, mm, it sounds so wrong. <laughs> okay, uh, about academic freedom could, with a little shove, be made into dancing bears. Basically, again, letting the students get what they want. Uh, eventually, the fascist thugs got everything they wanted. 
Wow. <laughs> the authorities caved in to their demands. The few who remained opposed quietly left the university, and, in some cases, the country, once it was clear that their safety could not be guaranteed. That is just insane. How... <laughs> Again, they are acting like this is their home where they're supposed to be heard. Which is it? Is it your home where these people are in charge of you? The authority is in charge of you? Or are you an adult and you can actually, um, yes, I agree, they can protest. But are they actually going to try to work something out if they're trying to act like adults? Either you're acting like a kid with a temper tantrum, or you're going to act like an adult who wants an actual compromise. If you're not... If you're not going to do that, then why should why should they listen to you? Because again, if you're trying to act like this is your home, at your home, do your parents listen to you? No, not on every single occasion, because they're in charge of you. They are the ones who make the rules. Likewise, if you're going to act like your college is your home, then the people there working, the faculty, and the professors, and everyone who has something to do with something that has to uh that pertains to your campus life is in charge of you and that's who you're supposed to listen to you're not gonna whine and get what you want and if you want to be an adult then you're gonna talk like a civil human being instead of protesting and rioting and doing stuff that's making you look insanely stupid that is also possibly dangerous you're going to instead act like an adult and try to make an actual compromise. And if you can't do that, then why should they even have to listen to you? Why should they back down and let you get everything you want? The University of Berlin in 1932, Milan in 1922. Good guesses, but this has all happened at Cornell. Oh my gosh. Cornell's another uh, Ivy League school. Um, Gosh, I'm like, you know, I want to go to an Ivy League. That would probably be ideal. Uh, <laughs> God damn. Um, Cornell is another Ivy League school. These Ivy League schools have the, uh, the future, basically. You know, these schools are looked at as schools where future leaders are going to attend. This is where the future starts. This is where the finest students in the nation and also around the world attend and they're rioting like this they're acting like children you're the future i don't think i want you for the future but this all happened at cornell in the spring of 1969 paramilitary black national oh my gosh <sighs> fucking shit Black nationalists under the banner of the Afro-American Society seized control of the university after waging an increasingly aggressive campaign of intimidation and violence. Yeah. And you wonder why I hate being black. No. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> um, well, no, that's... I don't agree with that. I don't condone that. There's a difference between being nationalistic about your race and then rioting and protesting and threatening to fucking kill people. Be <sighs> okay, so this wasn't about um, white ethnocentrism, but instead black ethnocentrism, which liberals are going to be like, it's okay because they're black. No, fuck you. Um, if they were white, they'd, uh, they'd immediately say this was fascist, but they're black, so it's okay. Um... No, this isn't right in, under any race. No race, no racial nationalist should should be uh, <laughs> should be threatening to fucking kill faculty at their school because they won't they won't teach them <laughs> the way that they want to be taught. That is, uh, this is even worse because like so close-minded. Uh, this is so disgusting to read. The public excuse for the armed seizure of the Cornell Student Union was a cross burning outside a black dorm. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this was later revealed to be a hoax. A fucking hoax. <laughs> Orchestrated by the black radicals themselves in order to provide a pretext for their violence. Oh my gosh. So these black nationalists are like, Yo, what are we gonna fucking do? We can't just fucking riot without a reason. Actually, you guys can because uh, all the time you guys are rioting without a reason. <laughs> if um, I watched this documentary once on the LA riots of the 90s, 
dude, they, I, I don't know exactly what caused the rioting, but they weren't. They just looked for an excuse to destroy stuff. Okay, and they, then they wonder why they have this stereotype of monkeys. I fucking... Dude, do not... <laughs> this is why I am white on the inside. This is why... Like, at school, I don't even refer to myself as black. Because this is just so disgraceful. If you're gonna act this way, then then maybe wonder why people stereotype you a certain way. Because the majority of you are doing this stupid shit that is just disgraceful. And... Honestly... I really want the black race to change, then I can maybe be proud of them, but they aren't changing, they're just doing their stupid shit all the time and making themselves look foolish, and then they wonder why they look like such a horrible race. Well, maybe because they are being a horrible race and acting horribly, so then that reflects badly on them. Sure, there are good people in our race, but for the most part, <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, that's probably extremely racist of me to say, but it is true. I am very sorry to say. But uh, until we uh, reshape ourselves, <laughs> I'm gonna criticize them. And this is just, wow, I'm gonna have to look into this. And if I do, if I do have the time to look into this, you bet I'm gonna make a fucking video on it, criticizing every fucking aspect of it. So... They're like, what are we gonna fucking do? How are we gonna riot? So they just put a fucking burning cross outside their dorm? For fun? Just to... <sighs> okay, so I have talked about Charles Manson on here before, that one shitty live stream I have on here. And uh, when, he, when he killed Sharon Tate, he basically... He put stuff... He put like a, a handprint on the wall, which is basically what the Black Panthers did. It was their paw print. Um, he put a, he put a black paw, he put, he put a blood stained handprint on the wall, he, well, he didn't do it, the people killing did, but, uh, the, the Manson family, whatever, they, uh, they put pigs on the wall, um, they put a bunch of other stuff, and they put Elter Skelter, which was basically the race war, that's what they were calling it, that's what they were calling it, and, um, so, <laughs> they thought that by killing Sharon Tate and then the next uh, day, uh, the LaBiancas, they thought by doing that, that the police would be alarmed about um, the Black Panthers and that um, people in Los Angeles would be alarmed about the Black Panthers, right? They thought, oh boy, if we do this, people are gonna initiate a race war. And that was their goal, a fucking race war. They thought that by doing it themselves and acting like it was the other race, that their goal would be achieved. Likewise, these people are doing the same thing by putting a fucking burning cross outside their fucking dorm because the KKK. Oh my gosh. Um, no, okay? Lots of shit happens at these Ivy League campuses, I think. There's one that's highly anti-Semitic, uh, right now. Like, I'm not kidding. Sure, that stuff does happen, but when you're doing it yourself and then acting like you have a right to riot because you wanna, you want to act like there is this thing here, just cause you think that you need to act like it's there so that you can get what you want? No, again, act like a fucking adult. Like, ugh. There are some, um, I've been to some college meetings at my school, and they say that if there's not a major at your, at, at the school, this is, this is just some schools, but if they don't have the major you want, alright, you can actually, you can actually ask to have your own personalized classes. If they wanted to hear something that was ethnocentrically black, they could have asked for it, especially at a fucking Ivy League. The Ivy Leagues would have listened, trust me, because they do want to cater to their students. Again, they're highly acclaimed. They want people to keep signing up for their school. They want the finest students, so they want people to 
to actually send in applications. Okay, so all they could have done was, hey, hey, you know, we have European studies, we have whatever other studies that are like ethnocentric, I don't know, maybe Latin studies, they have that, okay. Well, we want some sort of Pan-African study at this school. We want the study of blacks throughout history. If they wanted that, they could have easily asked. And if they wanted the teachers to be black too, I'm sure they could have catered to that as well. Trust me. So, they are just, <laughs> this. they look like idiots just doing this. And it's, it's deplorable. <laughs> um, no, it's just, it's so stupid. It's, it's moronic for them to do that. And they're painting the school in a bad light as well. It's like, no, get the fuck out of the school if you want to make us look bad. Um, and to overshadow the administration's faint-hearted and toothless reprimands of six black radicals who'd broken campus rules and state laws, except, you know, who cares? They're fucking black, so it's okay. Uh, uh, this Reichstag... Uh, fire style tactic worked perfectly as the gun toting fascist Guadristi stormed Straight Hall in the pre dawn hours, rousting bleary eyed parents who were staying there for a parents' weekend. These bewildered souls who had the misfortune to bankroll the educations of the very gun toting scholarship students, now calling them pigs, were forced to jump from a three foot high cargo deck into the freezing Ithaca rain. Oh man, and yeah, he really has a point right there. They're, they probably were scholarship students. Um, I don't think affirmative action was a big thing back then, yet. I, I don't believe so. Uh, I also have a video on that about abolishing affirmative action because it's stupid to racially choose people to go to your fucking school. I don't care if it benefits me. I mean, yeah, of course, I'm very happy that it benefits me. My chances of getting into the school I want to go to are very high. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, but even so, even though it benefits me, it doesn't make it right. And I'm not going to support it just because it benefits me. Um, not if it's something that isn't fair. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> uh, yeah, the very gun-toting scholarship students now calling them pigs. You're being funded by fucking white people. They're probably the people paying the majority of your scholarship because most black people are in poverty. Not poverty, but like, you know, they're not rich, okay? That's just fact, okay? Most black people aren't rich. So, um, yeah, um, the, the rich white people are the ones freaking funding your scholarship, and you're fucking calling them pigs and, you know, probably a bunch of other racist shit because, hey, we want more and we also just don't like white people, even though white people have done so much for black people. <laughs> and I, I talk about that also in my, my video that, you know, where I was accused of being racist so I had to respond to someone. Uh, yeah. Sorry, but that's true. White people have done so much for blacks, and yet at the yet they're just fucking around and acting like they're a bunch of race, a bunch of racists. And no, you you can't just do that. You can't just call people racist because you don't like their race, or or call them pigs or anything, just because you don't like their race if they haven't directly done shit to you. Uh, this is Nazism in its worst form, declared a mother with breathless if understandable, exaggeration. The university president, James A. Perkins, was required to cancel his morning convocation address, sublimely titled, The Stability of the University. Obviously not. Um, in popular myth, the 1960s was a gentle utopian movement that opposed the colonialist Vietnam War abroad and sought greater social equality and harmony at home. Um, even I don't believe that. I mean, I'm sure there was some peaceful protests. I'm sure Woodstock was great. <laughs> um, but for the most part, it's just a bunch of people yelling <laughs> and uh, destroying shit. And being really, like, 
there's lots of young people getting arrested because they aren't following social conduct. If you're gonna break the law, <laughs> then yeah, you're gonna get arrested. Um, but you know, that's revolution right there. It's rebellion in the best form. <laughs> Fucking shit. Um, and it is true that the vast majority of those young people who were drawn to what they called the movement were starry-eyed idealists who thought they were ushering in the age of Aquarius. See, like, I would have totally been, it, like, a hippie if I were born back then. But at the same time, it's just, like, now that I look at it, that's not a good thing. <laughs> Their revolution was not a good thing, and it is basically what brought the degeneracy we have in society. They're such idealists that they just hate... They hate everything about society that doesn't follow their utopian vision. I mean, again, the, that's not gonna work out. I mean, the fact that they're trying to form a utopia by being violent is kind of funny to me. Um, but, you know, they didn't think that out. <laughs> Still, in its strictly political dimension, there is no denying that the movement's activist core was little more than a fascist youth cult. Yes. <laughs> Indeed, the movement of the 1960s may be considered the third, greatest fa the third great fascist moment of the 20th century. The radicals of the New Left may have spoken about power to the people and the authentic voice of a new generation, but they really favored neither. Yes. Um, power to the people that agree with them, obviously and authentic voice of a new generation, or just the generation that you like. Again, I mean, people like to act like young people are so progressive and all that kind of shit. <laughs> There's that, that quote, if you're not a liberal, uh, bef if you're not a liberal before you're 20, then you have no heart. If you're, uh, not a con if you're not a conservative by your 40, then you have no brain. You know that quote? Yes, I'm not a liberal, and you know what? I don't mind not having a heart. I'd rather have a brain my whole life than not have a heart. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, people like to act like the young are so progressive, but even we're divided about it. Maybe we're more progressive, but uh, that still doesn't mean that some of us are not what would be considered progressive. Like me, I'm definitely not considered progressive. I mean, lots of people, I don't know where they got the impression that I was some little activist. Some girl at school literally is like, you're gonna be famous one day for being an activist. I'm like, um, maybe, but for the wrong reasons. <laughs> uh, definitely not for the activism you're calling for. Because the other day I was joking and I was like, if I was in the 1800s, I'd be totally pro-slavery. Obviously a joke because I am black, so. I mean, the the joke was that you know when when you when you like white boys, but you also want freedom. I mean, it was a fucking joke, right? And she just took it fucking seriously, and she was like, "Oh, okay." I mean, no, it's not to be taken seriously. But if you want to take it seriously, sure. And um, my jokes are pretty insensitive. <laughs> so, to lots of people. If you make jokes like that, you're not a good person, you're not progressive, you are staying in the past because you are still feeding the flames of racial inequality. And I think that's bullshit. Um, so, to me, no, not everyone who is young is some progressive, okay? And this authentic voice of a new generation is basically the voice that they want, the voice that they're shaping. Uh, that isn't really truly authentic, but the voice of the people who are pretty much with the most power trying to make a change that isn't really a change. Um, they were an avant-garde movement that sought to redefine not only politics, but human nature itself. Historically, fascism is of necessity and by design a form of youth movement, and all youth movements have more than a whiff of fascism about them. And this is because as I said in uh, one of my other one of the other readings of this book it's always easier to get to them while they're young the young are super impressionable and uh, that's I feel like I've grown I've grown up so fast because everything that young people are into I I've never really been into it when I was a kid yeah I was but 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 then I don't know I think I grew up way too fast this whole progressive outlook to me, I had that when I was eight, 
and not so much from that point onward because I realized life wasn't fair, life's not ideal, okay? Um, so I had that view when I was a little kid, but now I don't feel like a little kid anymore. And I have not felt like a little kid since I was probably 12. Probably even much before that. I mean, I've noticed so many things about the world way faster than a lot of kids can say. So to me, the, all the all these things, it's just, it's just, super impressionable it's super impressionable to me and uh i don't i don't i just don't blame any young person because yeah you're just a fucking idiot who listens and believes you listen you indoctrinate yourself and that's not a good way to be so i mean young people out there it's good to listen to these viewpoints but you do need to realize that um kids are impressionable and that includes you so, really, really try to look at it with an open mind. Try to see if there are any ulterior motives because you never know what you're putting yourself into. Um, let's see. The exaltation of passion over reason, action over deliberation is a naturally youthful impulse. Treating young people as equals, privileging their opinions precisely because they lack experience and knowledge, is an inherently fascist tendency, because at its heart lies the urge to throw off old ways and old dogmas in favor of what the Nazis called the idealism of the deed. And, um, I'm not gonna disagree. Not all tradition is good. Again, <laughs> slavery, that's, that's a good example. That's tradition. But was it good? No, obviously not. Um you know, killing people because they're different, you know, some people, some people did that, they're just, you know, discrimination, I suppose, that's an easier way to, that's an easier way to pinpoint it, discrimination on a mass scale, like segregation and whatnot, and, um, you know, acting like being gay was an abnormality that could be fixed, something like that, um, when it's like that, that's tradition, but it's not good, and there are ways to change people's outlook on life, but it doesn't just happen in one fell swoop. Again, people are just like, oh, the world's still so horrible. It, go back in the past and tell me if it wasn't as bad, and if we haven't made that much progress, because I think we've made a bunch of progress. And maybe it's because of where I live. I live in a super liberal state. Maybe. Maybe liberalism is good. For, for what it's worth, I would say, in some aspects, it is good. But, um, you know, still, the, this thing to say that all tradition is bad and you need to get rid of the old way, no, it's not. There's tradition that's good and there's tradition that's bad. And um, people are going to hold their own traditions and their own beliefs. And the matter of fact is, as a collective, we might all have to change, but as individuals, we're not. And that's probably what's more important, but in this, in, in the fascist sense, the collective is always going to outweigh the individual, and when you're an individual who doesn't have the same mind frame as the collective, it reflects badly on you, and people think of you as a horrible person, even if you're not a horrible person. So, they, um, they basically, they just want you out. They look at you as tradition, and they look at tradition as bad. So if tradition's bad, and you are seen as tradition, then you are inherently bad. Um, youth politics, like populism generally, is the politics of the tantrum and the hissy fit. <laughs> as I was saying earlier, they're just whining. Uh, the indulgence of so-called youth politics is one face of the sort of cowardice and insecurity that leads to the triumph of barbarism. While there's no disputing that Nazism's success was deeply connected to the privations of the Great German Depression, that should not that should not lead one to think that Nazism itself was a product of poverty. Even before World War I, Germany was undergoing a revolution of youth. The war merely accelerated these trends, heightening both idealism and alienation. Klaus Mann, the secular Jew and homosexual novelist, spoke for much of his generation when he wrote in 1927, We are a generation that is united, so 
so to speak, only by perplexity. As yet, we have not found the goal that might be able to dedicate us to common effort, although we all share the search for such a goal. And yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people try to search for this common goal, but that's because it's idealistic, and a big part of lots of people is to be idealistic. Um, it's hard to to think that no, there isn't going to be a way to find the common cause that will all unite us, uh, because reality <laughs> is hard to swallow. So um, it's hard for people to to think that no, there isn't this common cause because they don't want to look at the reality of it and they would rather just be a collective of sheeple. Um, so, man understated the cause, uh, the case. While young Germans were divided about what should replace the old order, they were united by more than mere perplexity. A sort of youthful identity poli politics had swept through Germany, fired by the notion that the new generation was different and better because it had been liberated from the politics of corrupt and cowardly old men, and was determined to create an authentic new order. German youth culture in the 1920s and early 1930s was ripe with rebelliousness, environmental mysticism, idealism, and no small amount of paganism, expressing attitudes that should be familiar to anyone who lived through the 1960s. They regarded family life as repressive and insincere, writes one historian. They believed sexuality in and out of marriage was shot through with hypocrisy, writes another. They too believed you couldn't trust anyone over 30 and despised the old materialistic order in all its manifestations. To them, parental religion was largely a sham, politics boastful and trivial, economics unscrupulous and deceitful, education stereotyped and lifeless, art trashy and sentimental, literature spurious and commercialized, drama tra tawdry and mechanical. Born of the middle class, the youth movement rejected even loathed middle class liberalism. Their goal, writes John Toland, was to establish a youth culture for fighting the bourgeois trinity of school, home, and church. And uh, I think you can still see that today in a sort of similar way. Um, but uh, I think that uh, that's just going to keep being a cyclical thing. People want to act like they're fighting for something when they really aren't. Even, like, even, even Shin here, they just want to, I don't know, it's just pretentious to me. I've always seen people who are just like, oh, I'm above that, you know? I mean, I can't, I can't say I'm not a pretentious person myself, but I'm able to admit it when it comes to stuff like this. Because again, as I said earlier, I grew up way too fast. Now that I see people with young adult novels, I'm just like, that's fucking idiotic. I, I read young adult novels when I was a little kid because to me back then, that was super adult. Because I didn't have the same mindset. I was like a teenager when I was a little kid. And now I'm an adult. I mean, you can argue otherwise, you can say I'm still childish and whatnot. Not gonna, I'm not gonna deny that I'm immature in many ways, but um, all this shit, it's just phony to me. And I guess that's after I read The Catcher in the Rye. I read that when I was 12. Changed my life forever. But everything everyone does to me, it's so phony and it's just so stupid. And everyone wants to act like, oh, I, I like this, it's quirky, isn't it? It's just so annoying. Shut the fuck up, no, no one fucking cares, okay? So, um, when they act like they're fighting for something, oh, oh, I'm doing this, I'm a good person. No, you're not, shut the fuck up. You are doing it because you want fucking attention. That is all you want. Uh, in cafes, they howled at the decadence of German society and cadences reminiscent of Alan... Ginsburg. In the woods, they com communed with nature, awaiting messages from the forest. A Führer, or popular acclaimed leader, might read passages from Nietzsche or the poet Stephen George, who wrote, The people and supreme wisdom yearn for the man, the deed, perhaps someone who sat for years among your murderers and slept in your prisons while, will, will stand up and do the deed. These young people, Toland writes, thriving on mysticism and impelled by idealism, yearned for action, any kind of action. 
Even before the Nazis seized power, student radicals were eager to challenge the stodgy conservatism of German higher education, which chairs classically liberal academic freedom and the authority of scholars and teachers. A wave of Nietzschean pragmatism, Julian Benda's phrase, had swept across Europe, bringing with it a wind that blew away the stale dogmas of their parents' generation, revealing a new world to be seen with fresh eyes. And I guess, um, I guess it's because kids want to dissociate themselves from tradition, and what more of a symbol of tradition is a parent? So they don't want to be like their parents, so they want to um, change. Of course, at the same time, their parents were probably a part of some revolutions themselves, or had some progressive ideas. So in the same sense, they're just repeating what their parents tried to do um, to their parents. Um, the Nazis told young people that their enthusiasm shouldn't be restrained through academic study, rather it should be indulged through political action. The tradition of study, for its own sake, was thrown aside in the name of relevance. Let us read no more of Jewish science and foreign abstractions, they cried. Let us learn of Germans and war and what we can do for the nation. Intuition, which young people have in abundance, was uh, more important than knowledge and experience, insisted the radicals. The youth loved how Hitler denounced the theorists ink nights he spat. What was required, according to Hitler, was a revolt against reason itself, for intellect has poisoned our people. And uh, now that it, they're saying that, they didn't like intellectuals, they didn't like people who could think for themselves, because again, yeah, they're thinking for themselves. That's extremely individual, and individuals are dissidents to them. Um, so when, when someone is an intellectual, it is seen as a threat to the collective. So. <laughs> intellectual and intellect has poisoned pe our people no it has poisoned their goal to try to create a a collective unity that is false just have bra you know people who are so brainwashed into following you when that intellectual comes into the mix they are going to de have a uh, descent and um yeah it's going to hurt the collective and it's going to hurt your plans Intellect is the best thing that anyone could ask for, but the left doesn't like intellectual diversity, and this is just another example of that. So, it seems like they haven't changed. Hitler rejoiced that he stole the hearts and minds of youth, transforming universities into incubators of activism for the fatherland. Deutschland du Baralis. <laughs> the Nazis succeeded with stunning speed in 1927 during a time of general prosperity. 77% of Prussian students insisted that the Aryan paragraph, barring Jews from employment, be incorporated into the charters of German universities. As a halfway measure, they fought for racial quotas that would limit the number of racially inappropriate students. In 1931, 60% of all German and undergraduates supported the Nazi student organization. Regional studies of Nazi participation found that students generally outpaced any other group in their support for national socialism. A key selling point for German youth was the Nazi emphasis on the need for increased student participation in university governance. Nazis believed that the voice of the students needs to be heard, and the importance of activism recognized as an essential part of higher education, foreshadowing a refrain common to American student radicals of the 1960s, like Columbia's, this is another fucking Ivy League, <laughs> like Columbia's Mark Rudd, who declared that the only legitimate job of the university was the creation and expansion of a revolutionary movement. Not intellectual diversity, guys. That's not what that's not what college is for. It's not so you can become well-rounded and introduced to different ideas, so you can be a fucking revolutionary. Obviously. Gosh. <laughs> the Nazis believed that the university should be an empowering incubator of revolutionaries, first and peddlers of abstraction, a very, very distant second. Okay, <laughs> I would say it's the opposite, but okay. Alright. <laughs> The Nazis' tolerance for dissident views sharply declined, of course, once they attained and solidified power, but the themes remained fairly constant. Indeed, the Nazis fulfilled their promise to increase student participation in university governance as part of a broader redefinition of the university itself. Walter Schultz, the director of the National Socialist Association of University Lecturers, laid out the new official doctrine in an address to the first gathering of the organization, wherein, he explained, that academic freedom must be redefined 
mind so that students and professors alike could work toward uh, together toward the larger cause. Neither has the German idea of freedom been conceived with greater life and vigor than in our day. Ultimately, freedom is nothing else but responsible service on behalf of the basic values of our being as a book. Professors who deviated from the new orthodoxy faced all the familiar tactics of the campus left in the 1960s. Their classrooms were barricaded or occupied, threats were put in their mail, denunciations were posted on campus bulletin boards and published in student newspapers, lectures were heckled. When administrators tried to block or punish these antics, the students mounted mass protest and the students naturally won, often forcing the resignation of the administrator. And again, it's just infantilization because they're giving them what they want, and that's not how the real world works. The real world is not a revolution. <laughs> so they're going to be pleasantly surprised when they step out of those college campuses. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop it there for now because we're reaching 50 minutes, and if I keep reading, I think I'm going to go... <laughs> I think I'm going to go over the hour, so I'd rather not... Um, I hope you guys like that one, because I actually really like this chapter, probably because it mirrors a lot of, uh, culture today, as I said, the 60s and onward, degenerate as hell. Uh, um, if you have any questions, or book recommendations, or just comments, please leave them below. I would dearly love to read them, uh, especially on this topic, it's quite interesting. And, uh, yeah, be sure to share, because I actually really like this video. This is a good one. <laughs> this is a good one. It has, <laughs> I'm just fucking reading and putting my comments in. I like this one. I can tell, I can tell when I'm recording and when I'm going to like a video, and this is definitely one of those videos. So it would be a pleasure if you could share it to other people that you think would be interested in uh, my stuff. So uh, thanks for listening. And bye.